when we were created, whoever our creator, he or she was, we weren't created to be perfect at anything. And nature guarantees that. And I read a lot of autobiographies on sports people and business people. And you take, I would often say at workshops, I give the example of Usain Bolt, fastest human being on earth. He won't be able to maintain it. Human nature won't allow him to do it. And through a, throughout all of those sports people's lives, they will have anything up to 10, maybe 15 coaches. But eventually they will become their own best coach. And that's what I learned on the Maguire program. That as soon as I became my own coach and not be dependent on others, it made a huge, huge difference to me. And as soon as I let go of the need to be perfect, it made a huge difference as well. So Michael O'Shea now verbally communicates to Michael O'Shea's satisfaction and to nobody else's. Amazing, Michael. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned in our chat that you were able to speak and read out aloud when you were young perfectly well. Mm. Could you share a bit of your thoughts, processes, as to why you thought that you could speak and read out aloud when you're on your own, and yet when you were with other people, adults specifically, you blocked? Okay, when I was a child and when I was growing up, if I was reading on my own, if I went for a walk on the beach on my own, walked through a forest on my own, I could speak without stuttering. This always amazed me. But you have to realize at the age of four, I got a severe beating off a nun in school. And that's when I started to stutter. I didn't speak for three months, and when I spoke again, I stuttered. This was compounded four years later, three years later, sorry, by a principal in the school. My own teacher was out sick and we had to go into his school and he asked me the question one morning and I wasn't able to say it. And I tried and I blocked and I blocked and he lost his temper and he hit me with a stick, a brass ferrule on the end of it. And the mark is still on my hand and he drew blood. But the message, to quicken this up, the message I got that morning was quite clear. I had to be very, very careful how I spoke around adults because if I didn't, it would result in physical pain. At the age of seven, I didn't know what emotional pain was. I was to learn that many years later. But from that point on, when I was reading in my room, at home even, and I saw somebody, I saw the door opening, immediately I'd stutter. And it all went back to that beating in school that I had to be careful around adults that I didn't stutter or it would end up with emotional and, phys and physical pain. Mm. I think that's what drove my stuttering system. That was the trigger then. And the amount of people I've interviewed for my book and everything else, that would have been a very a commonality with a lot of people that they experienced physical pain. So they learned their way into holding back. They learned their way into dividing. They learned their way into word substitution. Because the one thing that a person who's challenged by stuttering dreads, whether they're overt or covert. And the big, big fear is the fear of being exposed. And that's why we learn our way into holding back avoidance, word substitution, going quiet, being introverted. They're all connected. Or certainly were connected as far as I was I was concerned. Because if I went to a party, immediately I would go into the room and I would pick the best observation point in the room where I could see everybody coming towards me. And when somebody asked me my name and I would severely block on it and they were still standing there, my mindset was, what kind of tablets are those people on that are still standing there speaking to me or trying to speak to me? So that's how I looked at myself. And as I told you earlier, I had 
wound a web around myself that I was a person who stuttered. The label, I'm a stutterer. And that came first before I was a person. So it took me a long time to reverse that. Same with me, Michael, same with me. Um, what was the message you got while you were in speech therapy from a young age? The message I got, the older I got, I had a lovely speech therapist, she was a nun, and her name was Monica, and it's strange that my wife's name was Monica. Now, I couldn't say her name when I went to her, and I couldn't say my wife's name when I met her either. But Monica, I went to Monica for two years, and at the end of two years, Monica told me, and I was 10. I went at eight, and I stayed with her until 10. And I remember what she said, she said, Michael, I can do no more for you. But she said, I pray for you, she said, that you will learn your way out of stuttering. That's what she said, that you will learn your way out of stuttering. Now, you take 90, that would have been 1963. When I started with her, I was only eight years of age. At that time in Ireland, there was only about 10 what they call speech therapists. It was in its infancy. And my experience of speech therapy, I stopped doing speech therapy when I was 14 because I wasn't making progress. But I had learned that I needed to overcompensate in everything that I'd done in my life just to feel normal. I never felt normal as a stutterer. And to be honest with you, I've never interviewed anybody. And I would ask them, I had a set of questions. And one of the questions was, did you feel normal when you stuttered? And I think it's over 80% of the people said no. Now that was a combination of overt and covert. So they never felt normal. So I learned that my challenge with stuttering was my constant companion. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, was my constant companion. Mm -hmm. so I needed to embrace my stuttering. My stuttering needed to become my friend if I was going to learn my way out of it. And how did you do that? How did you embrace and how did you make stuttering your friend? I embrace my stuffing by telling us, listen, you're having an impact on my life. And both of us can have a good quality of life regarding my verbal communication. There are certain things that the two of us need to do together. And we need to learn our way out of the mindset and mentality, which I had learned. I mean, to say I created my stutter by developing. We developed the mindset and mentality. We developed holding back. We developed word substitution. We developed isolation because of our constant companion. Mm. So instead of, we would say, treating it as a war against my story, like my own personal opinion of war is when I think about war, I think about pain, pain for people, pain for humanity. Like, why should I, my stuffing had caused enough pain. I wasn't going to allow it to cause any more. So by embracing it, and instead of it being my enemy, to become my friend. And where I went, my stuffing went. And as it is the way, it still is my friend. I wear my stuffing on my sleeve. I am proud to say, I am a person who is challenged by stuttering sometimes. And that's a fact. I have odd blips in my speech every now and again. As I said, 98% of the time my speech is fine. And 2% you'll have a blip in your speech. Now that's caused by fusing the brain and everything from your past muscle memory and all that stuff. But like, you know, you learn resisting time pressure gives you a chance. 
don't resist it and you're going to get caught in the cycle of panic. And the cycle of panic will always go when you get in there, you get locked in. And some people have told me that when they're locked in, they not only lose touch with themselves, but they lose touch with everything that's around them. Yes, if they're unconscious, yeah. if they're unconscious patterns of being that holds them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I had to learn my way out of that. So one of the ways that I learned how to close the gate on the cycle of panic and close it shut was to stay connected with myself. And one of the best things that I found is to resist time pressure. Stay connected with yourself. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michael, for your insights.